I'm Sister Rose Gauthier. I was born in 1947 in Canada. I come from a family of four. I have a sister who is still living. And I was born in uh, Greenfield Park, south of Montreal, in a um, very predominantly French-English suburb. My family was not overly religious. Uh, they made sure, both my parents made sure, that we went to church, that um, we attended whatever activities, church activities, but they themselves were not very much involved. Um, my mother um, brought us to church when we were much younger, when we were six, seven years old. Um, and... Um, we went to school with our sisters, um, the daughters of the Holy Spirit, from the age of, my sister was started with first grade, I was in second grade, when we moved to Greenfield Park where our sisters were, were teaching. Um, and I like to think I had a very unusual experience in that um, the school we went to was all, there is no separation of religion and uh, state in, in Canada. Therefore, our sisters taught in regular schools and in, in the private schools were the Protestant schools. Um, and it was a very unusual situation in that um, one wing was French and one wing was English. We had our American sisters uh, teaching um, the English, we used to call it the English side. And our sisters from France, we had three sisters from France who taught um, the French Canadian speaking uh, children. Um, and also, uh, which were, was relatively rare still at that time in, in the uh, 50s, 60s, we always had some lay teachers. And I like to think that um, if we had had associates when I went to school with our sisters, all those teachers would have been associates of the daughters uh, because most of the sisters kept in touch with the lay staff um, in, the, in the years that I was there. It was quite a beautiful witness to us. I found a vocation um, to religious life and to the daughters of, of the, the Holy Spirit the way most of our sisters uh, did, uh, which is getting to know the sisters um, for, whom they, um, for who they were. I had a grand, a grand, two grand aunts and an aunt in another congregation, the, um, the Sisters of the Holy Name of Jesus and Mary, which was a large congregation in Canada. Um, what impressed me about our sisters were their simplicity um, and their openness, uh, their receptivity. Um, my father used to say, in French, so it's not quite translated the way you meant it, but our sisters were regular people. You could go and visit there. I, my father recalls an incident where, uh, um, an instance where uh, he went to visit and the superior took a, had gotten a, a six pack and put a beer in front of him. Mr. Gauthier, how about a nice cold beer? And he could not believe his, his eyes or his ears. And it touched him profoundly. It, it relaxed him that, you know, they were that much in touch with the world that, okay, there's a guy who's visiting here for two hours. Um, so th there was that sense of understanding people and being comfortable with people. Those were not the days where the sisters went to visit the homes. If it had been, they would have been in our home, and not only the homes of the well-to-do, and because we were a simple working family, um, 
Another thing that was interesting about our school experience is that um, for their time, they were tremendously avant-garde and op open. This uh, situation we had uh, with both French and English um, in the same school, sharing the same facilities, um, was very different. French and English in Canada, especially in Greenfield Park, um, didn't get along very well. There's a lot of um, prejudice, and our sisters simply didn't tolerate it. Everything that we did in common as a school was done in, in two languages, French and English. I entered because I had this sense that I didn't want the life that I saw people around me um, live. They grew up, they got married, they had children, uh, they worked maybe 10 miles from where they were living, and that was their life, that was their conversation, that was their horizon. And something within me called to, but I want more than that. More than that meant, at that point, apparently, join the congregation and teach. Um, and God, who listens so well and, and has a marvelous sense of humor, is like, you want more? Just wait a minute, honey. <laughs> Little do you know what I have in mind for you. And for that, I feel so blessed and so grateful. I entered in 1965, so we were on the cusp of Vatican II. We did not experience, I believe that myself and my group did not experience the great shock that some of our sisters experienced. It was more of a transition. Our group was the first group that was experiencing some changes. There were such things as chapter of faults, accusing yourself of small faults or lacks of charity or, or small transgressions to the rules. Uh, that was done away with in, in our group. Um, but we felt that we had a very strong formation coming out of the, the tradition of, of um, many generations of daughters of the Holy Spirit. And yet within a few years, by the time we uh, made profession in 1968 and were in, um, in mission, if you want, we were wearing modified habits by then. The rules were somewhat relaxed and the formation there kept on going. We, did not experience some of the difficulties and others had because right away when we started our formation, things started changing. Um, things that I do remember uh, much more than the change of habit and, um, and the like were the rule of life, which was in the early, uh, in the late 70s, maybe there was this, this chapter with the, the rule of life, which, um, made a big impression uh, on us because we, we studied it so well because it had just been given to us. Um, prior to um, the 70s, early 70s, we did not have a lot of exchange, um, community meetings, for example, we had to share, where we had to share a lot. And I still remember um, workshops that were given to us on personal work with Marjorie, uh, Fur, uh, Marjorie Furs and not so much Marjorie Fur, uh, to it right away, but Marjorie Furs and Imelda Michel, uh, where we learned uh, who we were. And being young religious, you're still in formation, your, your personality is still developing. Uh, to learn to, I remember collages that we did, me collages, that we had to share with each other. Uh, we younger sisters had an easier time with that than the older sisters, but everyone made an effort, and we really learned to work closely, more closely together, talk 
uh, at a somewhat deeper level. Um, and those changes uh, kept on going. Um, within a very short while after the chapters, we were no longer uh, focused so much on, um, well, I, I wouldn't say that we were still having corporate um, missions and uh, corp corporate works, but within a few years of that, we had closed some schools, which was, which was uh, a bit traumatic at times. And we closed them in order to be in places where we had not been before, being closer to the poor. That required that we let go of some of the power that we had. Now, um, our sisters were not necessarily principals of schools. Um, and so you had to learn to work with other people and be one among, uh, among others, as our rule, um, as our rule states. Um, that became a significant, a pass what became a significant passage for me was that, that states, and they will share the condition of the people. And that may have meant for some sisters living with the poor in poorer conditions, like in Appalachia, after Marjorie Tewitt, um, Sister Marjorie Tewitt came uh, and conducted workshops with us. And it also came in small ways, um, in the faculty room or in um, just being able to visit families. Uh, and being able to put yourself more in the place of, of, um, of the people we were serving. Um, within a few years of that, because more of our schools closed, um, well, that came in more in the 80s, I believe, or shortly before that, um, and now we were in a position where uh, sometimes you had to look for your own work because we didn't have these school, these these ministries that you all automatically got fed into, if you want. I started as a young religious. Um, I was a teacher because our order was largely a teaching order, and at the beginning it was not such an easy fit for me. Um, and um, within a few years, I, tr I was placed in different communities, and I guess I discovered the ministry of teaching and came to uh, truly love it, to truly be at home in it. Um, I was placed at some point at St. Mary's in Putnam uh, here, and I was there eight years. This was the longest I had been anywhere. And um, that is where, with the help of uh, one of our former sisters, um, this is where I discovered my gift of teaching, um, mostly with little ones. Within that time, I went for um, a master's in early childhood education and discovered that it was a, a really good fit for me. And I have seen that that ministry of teaching has brought uh, so many gifts to my life. Um, even uh, now that I am in different ministries, I am still using my, my, my uh, training and my um, gift as a teacher has served me well. I remember one uh, a sister, uh, Joan Chittister, a long, long time ago came to speak to us daughters, and she spoke about um, many of us are gifted and can do many things, and we do them well. If we are blessed enough to experience that at some point in our life, we find a job or a ministry where everything clicks, and now we are not operating uh, as only as a professional level, but at, at, um, at a giftedness level. And that's a gift to, from God. And I was fortunate, fortunate enough to discover that. Um, 
Can you talk about the other ministries you said you brought your... At some point, um, I had been in ministry of teaching with nursery school children and um, young children, kindergarten teacher, uh, kindergarten um, children for over 20 years. And um, I was finding that I was questioning whether I was burning out. And there was an opportunity at some point to um, go to Vermont. Um, I've said often enough, I'm not a very big, I have never thought of myself as a risk taker. But in retrospect, I have taken quite some risks. Um, not always knowing what I was getting into. And I think that was God working in my life. It's like, well, just, just make the first step and I'll take care of the rest. And I was, um, there was the opportunity to go to Vermont and I knew there were other sisters interested and I thought, I'll go and talk to the, the uh, provincial superior. What do I have to lose? And um, we'll explore that together. And I remember clearly saying, well, it's probably not going to happen, but I'm thinking about it. Uh, in discernment with uh, the provincial and uh, also my own personal prayer, um, it was uh, determined that I would be um, going to Vermont um, to be a pastoral minister. I was sent there with a, another sister who was retired. Um, so her presence was not formalized in any kind of paid position. And also with a sister who was working in a, the uh, parish that was uh, closest to um, St. Mary's in, in uh, Cambridge, Vermont. This was a marvelous experience for me. The beauty of the Vermont mountain fed my spirituality. Um, at the beginning, I couldn't get enough of it. Um, also, um, it, it allowed me to experience church in a different way. When you work in Catholic schools, the tendency is to form community within the Catholic school community. And yes, you go to Mass in the parish church and you try to do, sometimes you were um, doing CCD for that parish as well. Um, but there was, there was always a, um, a struggle to, to mesh the, the two. When I became pastoral assistant, it, it opened a, a whole vista that I had never known in that um, this was a, a parish which um, shared a priest with the next parish, which was 12 miles away, approximately 12 miles away. The, the uh, priest mostly came to say mass and some functions. Uh, but there was no religious presence, formal religious presence uh, in the parish. Um, so I became the, uh, the, the manager, in a way, of the parish and kind of learned as I went along with the help, um, with the help of a um, pastor, a 68-year-old 60, woman, who was the pastor of the first congregational church in the same village and who kind of mentored me and boosted me and um, into the role of leadership in that parish. Um, it was a very small parish, about 100 families. The pastor under whom I worked was a marvelous, ma marvelous man. He, the first thing he did, because he was coming on to the parish as well, he was new to the parish, and um, required that we did the uh, census for the whole parish, a hundred families within three months. Uh, so the other sister and I, Sister Connie um, Perrin and I, visited in their homes a hundred families, she was absolutely marvelous because she wouldn't take no for an answer. If people, well, then, you know, it's not, well, what would be convenient for you? And we ended up in almost every home in that parish, which meant I knew right away 
200 families fairly well. And um, it was a deep experience of community. Vermont people are private, traditional, uh, not extremely open to new people right away, but once they trust you, they trust you. And um, my role became um, one of uh, welcoming, one uh, of being the one who listens. As a young religious, I remember thinking that ministry was about, you're gonna lead people to God. And it was very simple because you did that all together. You were, you were five, 10, sometimes 15 in the community and you had a, a corporate uh, witness. Uh, in smaller groups, one of three sisters uh, being the only one employed, um, it became a different dynamic. How do you be daughter, um, being 200, almost 300 miles away from the center Putnam of Putnam, uh, how do you become a, a presence that's a religious, pro, uh, a, a, a religious presence? And uh, so my role became that of one who is simple, one who is welcoming, and also one who is seeing where, it's, where God is. Now I was no longer trying to say, well, how am I going to bring people to God? I learned that they already had God in their lives. They were with God in their own way. Was it always my way? No, it wasn't, but I learned to see God all over the place, in the children, in the families who weren't coming to church, in the families who were coming to church, in um, people who were so very generous with their time. Because as we know, in every parish, there's perhaps 10, 15% of people to get involved. Um, and I would say within my eight years there, we had at least 40% of the people involved in the parish in one way or the other. Um, I also learned the importance of leadership in a parish um, and the role of church in a parish. To this day, because I now am um, Director of Religious Education for uh, grades one to 10, a program that's about, that has um, 260 children or, and youth. Um, Where? Where? In, um, in Millbury, at St. Uh, Bridget and Assumption Church in Millbury. Um, the fit with the church is not always comfortable. I happen to believe that as much as we struggle with some of the issues and some of the um, injustices and some of what we see sometimes in terms of leadership, I haven't yet, even in looking around and in my interaction with this pastor, uh, with this pastor in Vermont, there is no perfect situation. And um, the, the call and the challenge is, so how do we find God? And how do we find God as a community together in this imperfect, imperfect group, in this imperfect institution? I haven't yet found a, a group that's able to reach as many people. Uh, in terms of uh, helping them or in terms of creating a space where they can find God together. It's a um, large number of people. Do you see successes a lot? Less and less. The culture is changing. I find um, that people, even the, the people in little places like Vermont, um, people have all kinds of demands and distractions as well. Um, they find community in other places than church. They find, if I want anything communicated uh, in my religious ed program, like 
If you want your child to be uh, receiving First Communion next year, they need a little preparation beyond that year. And I tell the first grade parents who do register them, tell your friends. Tell your friends, because I know they're on the sports field, even in first grade, second grade, third grade. Um, that's where they find community. Uh, one thing that's true, I also have a great deal to do with um, high school, high school kids. The one thing that we speak a lot about uh, as directors of religious education um, and as a staff of, of the uh, parish is that our teenagers are too busy. They are extremely responsible. Um, they are extremely open. They're open to um, the generation of their parents and their grandparents. When I started um, that, uh, as director of religious education, especially for high school, I'm thinking, yes, all right, what are they going to do with this old lady that I am? Am I going to be able to relate to them? Um, it's been said a lot, and it's true in my experience, that there is no generation gap with this generation of high schoolers. They don't have a problem sitting down and talking to you. Um, and they, they, they don't fight the system in a way. Um, but they are so, so very busy that they have a hard time making choices. Yes, I believe, uh, you know, we should go to Mass, and Mass is not a big deal. But it is not that important for them. Um, church is, though. God is. They're not terribly good about um, expressing, verbalizing what their faith is, is about, but they're also, they respond very well to service projects. Um, but they're constantly making choices. Uh, yes, I wanted to, to go to youth group, but you know that means, uh, well, there's a game that day, or there's that this day, or I'm, you know I'm involved in something in school. Um, and I question whether they have much time for reflection and co connecting with what it's all good things they're doing. My question is, how does God fit in their lives? because they, there's not much time for reflection. Um, so that's, I'm all over the place with the, the ministry here, but that is what I've uh, been gradually experiencing for a number of years now, especially as I deal with older children from, for sometimes in the RCIA pro, uh, program, um, with children from eight, eight years old to high school, to confirmation age. So basically that is what has been um, occupying my time and my energy and my prayer. So you moved from, you moved from primary classes into pastoral work? Uh, of sorts. I find, um, it, what I experience is a pastoral presence. Um, I certainly experienced that in Vermont, but I also experienced that in my work as a director of religious education um, alongside other directors of uh, religious education. Um, but what I also experience is that much of my life is still about teaching in a way um, to be a religious, uh, uh, certainly a director of religious education um, today is a lot of, about educating people. First of all, welcoming them so, but also sometimes I feel a little bit like the prophets that cry in the desert. Um, there's a very fine line between accepting and uh, inviting them to more. Sometimes it takes a chance, uh, the, the, um, sometimes it, it, it looks more like an invitation, sometimes it's a challenge. Sometimes you have to uh, uh, ask the hard questions. Well, yes, you want to receive the sacraments, 
for example, a first communion, or you want your child that for your child, or confirmation, what does that mean for you? Does that mean a relationship with God? Uh, I'm not overly hung up on rules. Um, on the other on uh, on the other side, there's also a need for um, w how does your faith take expression? It's it's one thing to say believe in God. How does that? How do you live out that faith? Do you live out? For me, the purpose of church, and possibly the only purpose of church, is to connect ourselves with other people of faith so that we can, and I say so often uh, in my program, we don't go to God alone. We don't go to God alone. And perhaps you feel you can, but uh, perhaps a person next to you can't and they need you to bring them along. And you have something to receive from them in, in, in um, going to God as well. Going to God with others for me includes the life that I live as a religious, as a daughter of the Holy Spirit. When I was a young religious, uh, you all did it together. In a way, it was easier um, because you were living with 10, 15, 8, 7 people. There was more space. You weren't rubbing elbows quite as closely, um, and you had the benefit of people's sharing experiences together. My favorite memory of my first two or three years in community were sisters were at table telling stories, telling stories of when they lived in Vermont, um, sharing uh, being two or three in a room. Um, and some of the experiences that, you know, coming into a new foundation and uh, using a door on, a, on two or three crates as a table and sitting on crates. I used to love those stories. Um, as we um, moved along, the communities got a lot smaller. And now our communities are um, sometimes two people, uh, as I live now with one other sister, sometimes three. The dynamic is much more challenging. It's much more, it's much different. Um, and sometimes you live alone. Uh, for a while in Vermont, one of the sisters I lived with who was retired fell sick and came back to Putnam, and the other sister went for another ministry and moved out. And the challenge for me was, how do I live that sense of community? One of the ways I still live that sense of community is that to remind myself every morning, this is not just my minutes. Not, I am not an I. This is not just my ministry. I am a we. I'm part of a we. When I uh, was in Vermont doing pastoral work, uh, it was the daughters who were there. And when the daughters in, uh, um, in Chile or in wherever, that's part of me too. When I speak to the students, uh, I let them know that there's a group I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm with. Living with two or three people, in a way, is part of, that. part of that we used to have to work out stuff. Because the older we get, the more we de develop our own personalities, we become a little bit entrenched in them. Um, one thing that helps me a lot is when I look at the news, when I look at especially countries as at war, uh, when I meet people in my ministries who are divorcing because they can't work this, things out, um, it helps me in community because I, I think that if anything at all is we live together, we share a spirituality, we believe that um, the spirit is among us, between us, 
and within us. And that this call that, that we have to live, uh, to live our lives in the love of God, we work out stuff when it's easy, when we're playing together and we're having fun, when we go and see a movie together, and when um, what we do is not understood by the other person, especially when somebody moves in. Takes a while, you're polite, very polite for a while, and then the stuff happens, it's like, well, you know, I assume this and I assume that, or why wasn't that done? And we start talking. Sometimes um, it changes what we believe, or, but it always changes our willingness to reach out and say, well, if this means that to her, I'm going to extend myself. And we take a deep breath and have the heart conversations, which allow us to have the heartwarming conversations that allow us to be daughters together and say, this is who we are together. This is what we believe in. Because at the, at the core, there's, there's so much there. There's so much there that, that help us to move with one spirit, with the grace of God, always with the grace of God. I feel so blessed in my religious life, not only to have been blessed with wonderful communities and wonderful experiences, and many of them moving from house to house and region to region, I've also been blessed to um, have had some international uh, experiences um, as a daughter. Um, one of them has been to go to Mexico to learn Spanish, which helped me a great deal when I was in Pawtucket teaching a school that was possibly 90% um, Spanish. And I was the only person there after I went to Mexico who could somewhat communicate enough to make people feel welcome. Another experience I've had, uh, which was very significant for me, was to um, serve as um, an interpreter. Um, I think four times, four or five times, I don't remember. Um, for, for chapters or international meetings, which broadened my, my perspective. The um, experience that affected me the most, I would say, was my experience um, as a translator um, in uh, the Cameroons in the 80s, I believe, um, whereby I went to a meeting of young sisters um, in the Cameroons uh, with uh, sisters from Nigeria and the Cameroons. I don't think Bur Burkina Faso had had young sisters then. And uh, previous to that, I did not say that to many people because I was not proud of it, but my view of our missions there is, well, it's no wonder we're having so many African sisters. It's a step up for them. And I questioned the wisdom of that. Um, I have, and the, um, my experience in the Cameroons, I would say, was a, a very deep conversion for me. Because what I, and I even get a little emotional, <laughs> what I experienced was young sisters in their 20s at that time, some in their 30s, with an incredible amount of faith. And I more than once found myself saying, I should have that much faith. Simplicity, faith, and extreme courage. Um, they were living in Muslim countries. They were, um, we were talking about community um, previously, um, experiencing community with sisters with missionary sisters, um, in some instances, sisters from United States, um, United States, England, and France all living together. Um, 
with other sisters not of their tribes, and there are very deep differences between tribes, and the amount of um, sharing and learning and letting go and openness that that required, it became so obvious to me that they had beautiful vocations and that they were such a tremendous gift to us. What came to me as I listened and listened some more is how could I have not known the uh, spiritual richness uh, that is there, that we were so gifted in um, the gift of people of other cultures and their willingness to take the risk to go on this journey. Um, one experience I had of that was in France, actually, with a, um, one of the uh, first African sisters who sat in uh, the museum, and several did, uh, the Museum of the Daughters of the Holy Spirit, and um, saying, uh, I am, uh, one was putting her foot, she had probably a size nine foot, and she's trying to put her foot in a wooden shoe that was probably size four, and she is saying, I am putting my foot in the sabot de ma mère, in the wooden shoe that my mother wore. And they had this big book with all the names of the sisters in the congregation, a great big book. And all the black sisters touched that book, patted and touched that book. And we are touching our history. They have a much greater sense of, and there's this, this woman who's black, and this is my mother, Maddie Bellavin. This is my mother, Renée Burel. It became such a, a, a profound experience of what they were experiencing and what we shared together. Uh, and I guess that's what gets me emotional, that across the world, across cultures, across language, across different experiences, that we all have that heritage. And they share it in as deep a way as we do, and experience in as deep a way. I tend to be very realist and sometimes a little pessimistic about where is this all going? One of the challenges of the future for me is in terms of how do we live the years we have left in um, a spirit-led way, in a hopeful way. I question that we are in a position where we don't have a lot of communities left. I believe that young people... Um, your young adults nowadays, um, as possibly in my time as well, what were they looking for? Community. I want to be like them. I want to live like that. In my uh, youth, that was easily identify, uh, identifiable. You had larger communities and you did one ministry. Now it's not so easy for the person out there, because most lay people are uh, living in their churches and other places, in, in places where peace and justice work is being done, um, they, live, they have a mission. If they wish one, they, they have one. Um, younger people today, my wish would be that we have, realistically, few communities but strong communities that find creative ways to um, have some visibility in terms of how do we live this charism together. The charism is, is there. My, my hope is that 
uh, we grow in our ability to put that across. I would absolutely love to see some color <laughs> in our um, Putnam province uh, so that there is a more um, free exchange of sisters from um, certainly the African vice provinces and possibly possibly our um, South American province. Um, I would love to see that happen as well to enrich who we are. Um, and that the way I see the future and the, uh, the hope for the future and the challenge for the future is how do we, uh, younger people, as well as those older who can, how do we um, increase our, or how do we create um, opportunities to, if not live in communities um, of more than two or three, um, how do we make community or form community together? That's how I see the future happening. Plus the deepening, the ever, the, that call is always there, the call to deepen who we are and to deepen our spirituality and the call to be faithful to what the Spirit has in mind for us as, as daughters. <laughs>